become as you're famous, I think you're very, uh, you know, become icon actually of the globalization, actually a symbol of the globalization because your, your, your famous book, uh, The World is Flat, is, uh, is basically a very long time best-selling author in China. In that book, you talked about, uh, you know, the uh, uh, globalization. So what's your uh, take now on the globalization? How are we going to take a look on this new trend that uh, globalization lead us? Well, it's a good place for us to start, Henry. You know, um, whenever I do webinars like this, often the first question people have is, is the world still flat? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I always start to laugh a little because I say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm sitting in my office in Bethesda, Maryland. My, my friend Henry's sitting in his office in Beijing and we're having a conversation as two individuals as if we were sitting across the desks from each other. Is the world still flat? Are you crazy? It's like flatter than ever. You know, Henry, I'll always remember when I wrote The World is Flat, 2004, basically, Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. Yes. 4G was like a parking place. Big data was a rap star. And Skype was a typo. A typographical error. All of those things, Henry, came after I wrote The World is Flat. So the world today actually is flatter than ever. We have never connected more different nodes than we have today. And we've never greased the connection, sped up the connection between those nodes more than we have today. But we've also done a third thing. We've actually removed a lot of the buffers that manage the flow between those nodes. So think of this, Henry, between December 2019 and March 2020, just as coronavirus was emerging, there were 3,200 direct flights from China to America. There were 50 direct flights from Wuhan to America. Most Americans had never even heard of Wuhan. So Think about what's going on in the Suez Canal today. There's a ship stuck in the Suez Canal. And there is some company in Europe or maybe in China waiting for its supply from China because of just-in-time inventory delivery. You know? um, but when we, when we take the buffers out, um, uh, the system just gets faster and faster. And so... Um, the world isn't just flat now, Henry, it's fragile. It's fragile because when you connect so many nodes and then you speed up the connection between those nodes, but you take the buffers out, you get fragility because now I can transmit instability from my node to your node faster than ever. So yes, globalization, you know, ever since that, when I wrote The World is Flat, Henry, many people wrote books. Oh, it's not flat. It's spiky. It's lumpy. It's curved. It's bumpy. All those books are wrong. Okay. The world is flatter than ever. Great, Tom. I think that, that's absolutely uh, the correct. I think the, uh, the globalization is uh, accelerating, actually, to some extent. Where's the technology? Where's the uh, 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 all the speed that, uh, uh, you know, that we are involved in on that? But, but also the movement of the capital, the movement of the uh, goods and the movement of the uh, uh, talent, uh, all those things has been actually become the heavier and faster than before. So, so what do you think about the future trend? Are we, are we looking at some new uh, development trend? We've seen the uh, digital economy is coming up. And uh, as you said, there's probably 20,000 people you know, across Pacific between China and the US during the, before the pandemic times. And uh, so we have 400,000 students, Chinese students in the U.S. Uh, before the pandemic, China has about uh, 150 million outbound tourists. 10 million people go to Japan and another 10 million go to Thailand and 3 million went to U.S. What are, are we seeing in the future then? Yeah. The book I'm working on now, Henry, um, if, if, if I gave it a name and it doesn't have a name yet, is that the world is not just flat anymore. The world is not fast fused, deep, and open. Mm -hmm. let's, let's go through all four of those. So when I say the world is fast now, what I mean is that 
there's been a change in the pace of change. So the speed of technological change now just gets faster and faster and faster as microchips improve and telecommunications improve. So the world is really getting fast. Second, the world isn't just flat now, Henry, it's fused. So we're not just interconnected. We're now interdependent. A ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal and something that Tom is waiting for in Bethesda and that Henry's waiting for in Beijing are both affected. So we're not just connected, we're fused together, okay? We're also fused together by climate, okay? What America does with its air affects Canada. What China does with its air can affect uh, you know, Thailand. What Australia does with its forest fires affects New Zealand. So we're fused by technology and by climate. Third, the world's gotten deep, deep. Deep is the most important word of this era. Because what we've done now, Henry, is we've put sensors everywhere. So, you know, for many years, for millennia, Henry, the world has been speaking to us, but we just couldn't hear it. We couldn't hear it. So IBM did a study a few years ago. They took a lake in New York state and they put sensors from the surface all the way to the bottom and from one edge to the other. Suddenly a lake that was just there, it was beautiful, we drove by it. Suddenly the lake started to speak, started to tell what was going on at the bottom, at the middle, at the next level, with fish, with fauna, with all kinds of things. Well, imagine now our knowledge of that is deep. It's very deep. And that's why this word deep, we had to coin a new adjective, deep state, deep mind, deep medicine, deep research, deep fake, to describe the fact that oh, this is going deep inside of me. I can sit here in Bethesda right now in Washington and I can look at publicly available satellite pictures of different parts of China, from Google Earth, from the European Space Satellite. I can, I can look deep. I, I could probably find your office, Henry, and see if you're coming to work. And China can see into Minneapolis, my hometown. So the world's getting deep. And lastly, it's getting radically open radically open. So with this, Henry, every mm -hmm. citizen is now a paparazzi, a filmmaker, a journalist, a publisher, with no editor, mm -hmm. no filter. And with this, a citizen in my hometown in Minneapolis took a picture of a policeman with the knee on the neck of a man named George Floyd. One person did that with this thing, with this device. And George Floyd became a name that went all over the world. People in China know the name George Floyd because an individual with this in an open world was able to tell that story. Same is true from China. We saw that in Hong Kong. We've seen it in other areas. So the world is getting fast, fused, deep, and open. And that is the central governing challenge today. How do you govern a world that's that fast, fused, deep, and open? That is our challenge. Yes, uh, uh, great, Tom. I, I think that you are now thinking something deeper and open and uh, and fast. And the new trend you've been catching that for the for the for the next phase of globalization, I think it's no longer just flat, but we have a, a many more layers on that now. I think the, you you pose a, a very profound question: is that uh, the the system that we've been built up, been based on the uh, past the centuries, or even uh, based on the Britain Wood system that built up after Second World War, uh, are we 
to equip, cope with this, uh, uh, all those new challenges now. I mean, the world is really getting so fascinating and so changeable and, uh, and the, the system needs to, uh, how to, how to react. After the Second World we have this new system, uh, uh, you know, build up. Now we have this pandemic, uh, which I think poses enormous challenge for us for, for how to respect nature. Uh, are we going to have um, uh, more buffers, as you said in our last time uh, in our uh, uh, November conference? I know that you, you studied the financial crisis and that we studied, uh, you know, uh, SARS and now we have this COVID. So what, what's next? I'm glad to see that President Biden now uh, comes up. The first bill he signed, his order he signed is to, uh, to you know, uh, come back to the Paris uh, Climate Change Accord. And, uh, and you actually interviewed President Biden uh, uh, before he took office. So, so what do you think about these uh, new buffers that actually we're trying to build and or maybe uh, trying to, uh, are we losing that because of the global governance falling behind now? When the world gets this fast fused, deep and open, Henry, there's only one way to govern it effectively, both at the national level, the local level and the international level. And that's with what I call complex adaptive coalitions complex adaptive coalitions. So I take that term actually from nature. See, I think a fast fuse, deep and open world, it's like a big climate change. The world's going through a big change in our climate, not just the climate of the climate, but the climate of everything, of technology, of globalization, et cetera. And in nature, when an ecosystem goes through a climate change, which ecosystems thrive, survive? Those that have complex adaptive networks, okay, where all the parts of the system network together to maximize their resilience and their propulsion, their ability to go forward. Well, it's, it's true of the world as well. When the world gets this fast fuse deep and open, the only way we can govern it effectively is with global complex adaptive coalitions. Who can manage China, climate change? Unless America, China, and Europe in particular, and India and Japan and Korea, the big economies are all working together. It's impossible. Who can manage global trade now? Unless all the big economies are working together. So it's only complex adaptive coalitions that can effectively get the best out of this world and cushion. The problem, Henry, is that right when that is the need, complex adaptive coalitions, governments are becoming more nationalistic. Mm -hmm. China's government's becoming more nationalistic. Under President Trump, America became more nationalistic. Russia, more nationalistic. Britain, Brexit, more nationalistic. So countries are becoming more nationalistic right when we need global coalitions more than ever. And even inside countries, companies, con political parties are becoming more tribal, more tribal, right when they need to be more open and collaborative. So the world is fighting with this trend. Yes, uh, I, I, I think you're right. I think the, the, it looks like the, the global governance is really lags behind go, global, global practice or globalization. Uh, pace. The, the, problem is, the problem, Henry, is that there's a whole set of issues now that can only be managed effectively with global governance, cyber, financial flows, trade, climate, labor flows. They require global governance but there's no global government. So mm -hmm. what, what do we do when we need global governance, but there is no global government? Okay, we, we have this problem. And when US, China, the two biggest countries, then start fighting in the middle, it, the situation gets even worse.